Okay. Um, so we're, we're going. And as I'm starting, I'm getting texts that I have to tell people I can't answer right now. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to our first ever demo of Survey Down. We're going to see how this goes. Um, cool. This is a project that, well, Ping Fan and I, who's sitting beside me here, uh, have been working on since the summer, early summer, uh, sort of July-ish. Um, the idea we've had for a long time, I'll even go back to the history a little bit here. Um, whoops, something is trying to screenshot. I have a, a blog post on this from a little while ago. This was April of 23. And I said, this is an open source markdown based survey framework that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> As I wrote this post about like what I wanted and I didn't know how to build it. And I had thought about this for years, but I, I finally decided, let me just kind of draft the idea and maybe someone else will, will help me. And then no one helped me. And so <laughs> we kept waiting and I was like, we'll wait for it. And then I met Ping Fan who joined my lab and, and then I introduced the idea to him and he said, okay, I'll, I'll do it as a summer project. And now it's like a fully functioning thing. So it, it, I, it, as a summer project, as far as they go, this, this became like way more than I <laughs> expected. Um, so we have a website, surveydown.org, and you can go here to learn everything about it. The documentation on how to use it is pretty detailed. We've covered uh, as many things as we can think of. But let me kind of back up and talk about what is the motivation for this and why, why do we need another survey platform? Um, so I do a lot of survey work, and I get very frustrated with how we make surveys. Most surveys are kind of like this, like a Google form. And if you've ever made one of these, it's it's a GUI interface, right? Like a graphic interface. It's nice. It works nice. You know, you write your question, you write your options, you hit, you know, add a new question. It's clean, um, <clears throat> but it's very simple. So it's super limited, right? You can only do simple things. And if all you need is a simple survey, then you should just use this. Like it's perfectly easy, um, but it's not reproducible really in any way. Like I cannot take this survey and send it to you and then say, you can edit it with me. It's very hard to collaborate. Now on Google, you could, right? You could just log in with your Google accounts and maybe co-edit a survey. Um, but when you have a complicated survey, that's like a hundred questions long, this, this gets annoying. And other platforms are kind of the same way. Like um, what's, what's the Qualtrics, right? Qualtrics is a, another one that you, you know, you have to have a license, you have to log in. It has all kinds of features that like, if you want the more advanced features, you have to pay for them. And so we don't have anything that's one open source that's easy to collaborate on and like version control. There, there are some like Lime Survey is is open source, but again, it's not a it's a sort of graphic interface like this. What I wanted was a plain text based survey platform, and that doesn't exist. So I was inspired by Corto, so I use Corto for a lot of things. And so I'll start by introducing what is Corto because this is kind of what we built upon. Corto is a plain text publishing system. Um, so what that means is I have a little tiny demo here. You have a plain text file that is a QMD file and you write some plain text and you render it into some output. So your default output is an HTML page. So I click render <clears throat> and I get this. This is a web page that has, you know, hello, this is a demo. And you can add all kinds of nice things here. You can add in code chunks that do things like print a sequence from one to 10 or something. And when you render it, it will show you that code and the output. Very nice. Um, you can make plots, uh, you know, give me a histogram of that and render that. And it renders into a page. So um, that's what a uniform distribution looks like. Okay. Um, so it's great for scientific work where you are doing these <clears throat> static output pages. You know, you want to write a paper. You can write whole papers this way. You can render this to a PDF. You just change this to PDF and it works. Um, and so you can write papers this way. You can uh, build slides. In fact, there's also a reveal JS format <clears throat> that you can create a PowerPoint deck out of. Um, um, so it's it's a quite nice platform. And so this is what I wanted. I said, I want this, but I want it to render to a survey. Right. So I, I want to be able to say, you know, here's a question and I can just just like I have in my Google form. But I have, you know, code chunks that that define questions. And then I have a lot of nice things for free there. Now this is plain text, so I can push this to GitHub. I can version control it very easily. I can collaborate very easily. There's no licenses, you know, required for you don't have to log in to Google to get access to it. You just need to have access to my GitHub repo and we can go to town, you know, designing our surveys. So <clears throat> fundamentally, though, this is like a problem because Cordo does not render to interactive 
pages. It renders to static pages. This page is a, <clears throat> oh, I broke it, but with this thing that doesn't exist. Um, <clears throat> it, this is a static page. Hello. Uh, actually, no, this is, Re <laughs> this is reveal JS, by the way. That's what a power, so you can put dash and then have like another, another slide, just showing you know, the things you can do with Quarto. It's, it's quite nice. Um, and uh, there, you know, I have a slides now. It's a slideshow. Um, but this this is ultimately just a static file. This demo.html file is <clears throat> what gets created. And so we thought, what if we made our own package that would sort of somehow convert this content that's static into a interactive uh, web app? And R has a nice package called Shiny that some people use for making interactive dashboards. And so we thought, why not that? Let's start with Shiny and try to hack together Cordo and Shiny. And <clears throat> we're going to be using all the widgets, the little HTML widgets from Shiny to create our inputs, uh, which would become questions on your survey. And then you click on those and you restore your data uh, somewhere. So that was the that was the idea. That was the vision. And it's this is it. So this is our little diagram of what is uh, this whole package. It's an R package, but it's pulling together Cordo, which is kind of the front end, which is what you see. So you design your survey as a Cordo document. And then it's using Shiny in the back end to sort of make that come alive, like to create the widgets that are interactive. And then we store the data somewhere. We, we, we're using Supabase, but you can use any really SQL database. But this one's free and easy to work with. So we'll, we kind of demo that as uh, our default database for storing responses. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through the demo that, like, the way we intend you to get started. And if you go to our documentation, there's a big button that says click here to get started. <laughs> um, and so this, this one page covers the high level, like, what is it? How does it work? So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk through this for a minute and then walk through each of those steps and just show you like a basic working demo. So the idea is we have two files. We have a Cordo file, QMD. This is where we're designing what goes on our survey. But any text or images or questions that we want, everything is in there. And then we have an app. This is the shiny app that sets sort of any global settings, like where what are your configuration for your database, where you want to store the data. Um, are there any complex things you want to have happen, like complex logic, like when they click on this button, they skip to the end of the survey, or when they click on this button, this thing pops up. Um, we have to define that in the server because this is where you're defining the interactive bits. Cordo is just defining the static stuff that doesn't really change. Um, so those are our two files. Um, and then uh, I'll, get, I'll get started here in a minute. I'll install it and do a template. <clears throat> but uh, the main way we structure things is you define pages with these little three colon mark things. These are called fences. And this is a common feature of Cordo anyway. Um, Cordo will often use these fences uh, with some sort of special name. That's an ID for the, it it's ultimately creates an HTML div. So that would be your name and this is any class. And so we have a special class called SD page. Uh, and so when it renders, it's going to be able to say all of this content between these two fences is on this page. And then here's another, so that's how you make different pages. And if you want to make a question, you have a function called SD question. So all of our functions in this package start with SD for survey down, so they're easy to find. And this would render into that. Okay, so you have an ID, or so you have a type. We have a lot of different types of questions. This is multiple choice. A unique identifier for that, and that's going to be what shows up in your data. So you're going to have a data file that says, you know, penguins as a column, and here's all the responses. We're one row per, per each person who responds. What's the label and what options? Um, so again, this is what the person would see on the page. This is what gets stored in your database. Um, so that is what you would see, you know, a widget like this. You click the button and it stores that value. <clears throat> um, okay. And then we have lots of other control options and database stuff, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So let's let's get started. So I'll, installation, um, it's on CRAN now, so you can just say install.packages. Um, I already have it installed, but you can just run that line in R and it will install the package. Uh, then we suggest you get started with a, um, oh, that opened in a new tab, uh, in a template. I don't know why these are opening in new tabs. <laughs> we should fix that. Um, so we, we have a template function called SD create survey, and it just makes a template for you. So I'm going to open up our studio and I don't actually know where it's pointing right now. Uh, it looks like it's in my, let's put it in my downloads folder. And I'll create a, I'll just leave it here. I'll call it foo. 
Okay, it's going to be a folder called foo, and it's going to create a survey, and there we go. Um, so in my downloads folder, I have a, uh, where did it go? Here, it's in this quarter demo thing, foo. I'm going to, I'm going to quit this and move, move this up to here, just so that's, that's where I know where I'm, I'm working from. So it creates these threefold files, a R project file, which is just for keeping yourself organized. If you work in our studio, which is what I recommend for this, it works well. And then you have your app and your survey. Um, so this is a very simple two-page survey. It just shows you how to set up the basic structure, and then you can build from that. Um, and then your app, which also has like a templated structure. So we have a database that's completely empty. There's We're eventually going to have to fill out some, some information to where we want to store uh, our data. And that's, that's our configuration file for our database. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. A really simple template server where we might drop in some logic for skipping or showing hidden things and stuff like that, um, and then run the app. So this stuff, we don't actually have to change anything. The survey content itself, uh, we, we do have to load our, our library. Um, so this is our first page. It says welcome, and this will go down to here. So this is our, <clears throat> everything between here is page one. And we're just using Markdown, right? So a, a single hash will make a large font, you know, a large font header. Here's the multiple choice question about penguins. And then a next button that goes on to the next page. Uh, and then the last page, it says, uh, uh, ask another question and then end. Um, so we can, uh, we don't actually have to do anything with this. We don't have to render this or anything. We just run our app. We never actually render the QMD. We just run the app and, um, it renders all that content and then displays it. So that content that wasn't here, uh, <clears throat> a lot of things happened, but you'll see a survey file uh, folder got created and all these little files are in here. So that was basically us, um, survey down looks at this thing. It renders it and it chops it up into pieces and it stores the pieces that it needs. And then it grabs those pieces and displays it in the app. So you're seeing the first page now and that's your multiple choice question. Uh, okay, then we hit the next button and we go on to the next page. This says, write a silly word, ASDF, classic word. And then uh, end the survey. So exit and you leave, um, it closes the browser. Um, so this is all running locally, right? This is just a local shiny app. Um, you could serve this anywhere you wanted. You could send it. Uh, typically, shinyapps.io is where we uh, ship things for free. <laughs> if you want to ship a, an app to a free server, but you can host it on any server you want. Um, <clears throat> and that's a really simple survey. So this is a lot of work for like something that a Google form could have done right at this point. But the whole purpose of this was to be able to do kind of anything now. Like now that we're working in code. And we have the ability to run our code in our survey uh, or Python code. Um, you can kind of do a lot of different things. Um, so I'll show a few more complex demos in a, in a minute here. But that's that's the really really basic stuff. Um, maybe maybe one other thing I want to show is we have a few helper functions that help you create new pages and new questions. So um, let's say I want to insert a page here. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, if you say next page, by default, it'll just go on to the next one. Um, yeah, uh, if uh, if you have, you can tell it to go to a specific page, like go to this end page. But if you don't tell it anything, it'll just go to the next one. So if I want to insert a new page, I can have a, I have a function called SD um, add page. And if I run this, it will, uh, oh, selected lines, just showing you manually how to do that. It just replaces it with the template content. So you have like a new page ID and we'll, I don't know, call this page foo or something. And uh, here's a page title and here's some content. And then I have a, an SD question. I can SD add a question um, and I can give it a type. Like let's call it a select type question. And then I can run that and it just drops in some default text. Um, and we do that because like um, it's, like it's it's tricky to make sure you don't miss anything. So this is an easy way to like just insert questions that have some default content, and then you can just edit that content. Of course, you can you can also go to the documentation. We have we have question types um, here, and there's all kinds of questions. So if you want a you know a multiple choice like this, then you can just see this example, and you could copy that and and bring it over and uh, drop it in, um, uh, and then add a next button. If you don't add a next button, you can't go anywhere. So your survey stops. That's actually how you stop a survey. So sorry that you can have an end and, you know, end the page is what we have here. We have an SD close button, but you can also just not have this 
And then the user just gets to a page that they can't leave. So that's the end of the survey. You can just be like, this is the end. Uh, close it, you know. Where's the, where's the, uh, Nowhere. It just, I mean, where's the, the like, data? It yes, yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about data handling in a minute. Um, so temporarily, when you're not connected to a database, you just see your data here. The, we, we have this little preview data CSV file, which is purely for previewing purposes. It, it shows you what you can expect your resulting data to look like. And so you can see I have like, keeps it keeps timestamps of when you started and ended. This was my penguins question, right? And I chose Gen 2. Silly word, I wrote ASDF. Um, and it has timestamps of when I entered those, um, as well as timestamps of when I got to each page. Uh, and, the, and the very, the page you, you are most recently on, which was the end. Um, so I, I added a question about uh, Taylor Swift albums here. So let's run my app again, and it'll update. It'll it'll re-render that page, and I'll have another question. So here I'm going to put Chinstrap. And by the way, you can you can see uh, I have a new you know entry now, right? I have a yet an, a new respondent. So it'll it'll start recording, and um, now Chinstrap is there, right? So let's see some some albums, um, something here. Uh, huh? Were those your favorite? I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment. Uh, 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 I'm not gonna out myself and 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 and, and, <laughs> and anger all the Swifties. Um, I don't want to choose the wrong thing. But anyway, so here you go. I mean, so <clears throat> this, this, I got rid of the button, right? So it just, just says this is the end. Like, close the window, dude. Like, there's nothing else you can do here. You can't go anywhere. So that is the end. Um, and now until I close it, it doesn't track the time end, right? But this is. My data, and you can see, you know, those are the albums I chose. Um, so it's is tracking everything. And if I once I close it, then it'll it'll show up. That's when I ended the survey. So, but again, that's only for preview. So you're you're not going to be storing data this way. When you actually make your app live on the web, you're going to have a database connection, um, which is what this whole bit is about. Um, <clears throat> and you you connect to a database, and and those it'll look exactly like this, but you'll see it being rendered in your database table. And that's that's how we handle uh, the fact that we want to have more than one user, right? So we're, we we can have lots of concurrent users all taking our survey at the same time, and they're all entering on different rows. Um, and you don't really have to worry about concurrence problems. Like that's all handled in the database side. So things are things are carefully thought through, and we're relying on Supabase, which is an amazing open source database package. I mean, this whole this whole thing that they've created is is incredible. So. Um, so it does all that work for us. So that's that's the basics of the survey. Um, let me show you a few other you know examples of of some things. So we have some demos. Um, we actually have a full repo of demos that you can preview. Um, and uh, we have this this demos repo. Um, so our, we have a survey down dev organization, and the package itself, the R package survey down is here. The source code for this website is also just a Quarto website. <laughs> so that's right here. Um, and then the demos uh, is just lots of different examples of you know showcasing things that you might want to try. And if you're not sure how to implement it, um, that's that's uh, uh, some some code you can pull from. So I'll, I'll showcase a few. So, so one you might want to do is show if commands. Um, and these are live, actually. Um, so this is a live app on shinyapps.io, um, and um, it's uh, it, this this is it. Um, but I'll show it on my computer as well. And so show if is saying uh, show something if some other condition is true, right? So in this case, I have like what's your favorite penguin. What if I have an other? Then I want this to pop up, right? I want to show this question only if the answer to this one is other. Otherwise, you've made your choice. So my other type of penguin, I don't know. Does anyone have a other type of thing when they refer? <laughs> All right, so that's that's what that is about. Um, so something here, um, but you can have complex conditions. You might have other and some other condition. You might want to have the joint condition of if both of these things are these two specific answers, then show it. So here I have other, but I'm only going to see it if I say show it. If I say hide it, it doesn't show up. Um, so we have lots of logic conditions that you can put in, um, uh, and you can. This is a a, a page demoing. A more complex condition. So how many cars do you have? Well, only if the condition gets past a certain number. So two. If you have more than one, you have two, then it says, is your backup car a gas or an EV? Um, and I think, was there anything else if I go more? No. no, no. Um, 
And then uh, this one was really complicated. So if you say apple, it asks you how many apples you eat each day. If you say banana, uh, it says how many bananas do you eat each day? And if you say uh, two things or these don't do anything. But as soon as I have more than four, then it says you picked a lot of fruits. How many did you eat in a day? Um, <laughs> so we have lots of different conditions here um, that you can control. And that that's a kind of feature you, you might expect in like, Implementing something like that, as simple as that looks, is actually getting pretty hard in a lot of survey platforms. Like Google Forms already is sort of, I don't think you can do this. You might be able to, but you probably have to do some crazy app script stuff. Um, I You can probably do this in Qualtrics, but I don't know how easy it is. And if you wanted to change one of those things, uh, or if you had a collaborator who wanted to edit it, they would have to log in and or copy your whole survey and make a demo. So it gets really messy very fast. So I'll show you. And Qualtrics is not cheap. Yeah. This one's very cheap. It's it's uh, it's free. So, um, so let me show you. Yeah, the conjoint demo I can I can also showcase. That's got a lot more complexity in it. But let me showcase how we kind of set this one up. So, how you do these show if conditions? Um, you have to have the questions there, right? So this question is always here. You know, this is the other you know option. So if you choose other, I want you to show the the penguin simple other ID. Um, and so over in my app, I have in my server a SD show if function, and I can have all kinds of conditions. So these are all the conditions for the survey. So this first one is the first condition. If this penguin simple, which is this input ID, so that's this identifier, if that is equal to other, then I want you to show this one. That's the language. That's it. So you put a tilde sign. So this is the condition on the left, the ID that you want to show on the right. That's it. Um, and so your condition can be really complicated. So the one about the EV ownership thing, like this is the input for the cars, right? We have a question called um, car number. Or is it cars? Cars, where is it? Uh, ba -ba -ba. It's further down, car number. <clears throat> and it says how many, and so I wanna show this EV ownership question only if this number was greater than some number. So if it's greater than one, meaning two or more, then show that one. And this one I had to put as numeric because everything in survey down is a, is a string. So everything is passed around as strings. So I'm gonna convert it to a number in you know, greater than one. Simple logic. Uh, this one has two conditions for the fruit. If, if the favorite fruit was apple or banana, so if it's either of these, this is a, you know, a in operator. So if this is in this vector, then show the apple or banana question. Otherwise, if it's more than three, so you show you click four or more fruits, then you're going to say this fruit number question, which is like yet another question. So this one is the apple or banana question. This is the fruit number question that says, you know, you picked a lot of fruit types, like which, how many do you choose? Um, and what's even a little more tricky in here is the, the apple or banana one. Remember, if I chose apple, it says, how many apples did you do? And if I click banana, it says, how many pet bananas? Well, we're using glue here, which is a handy function in R, a uh, glue package, to glue together some strings. So we actually are uh, taking the output, which is this whole thing, the output of your favorite fruits, right? So whatever you chose, if you chose banana, we have a function called SD output, and it's going to grab whatever you chose for that, that question. And we have type equals value. So it's going to extract the value, which is this. This would be the label, right? Or this is the label, this is the value. So we're saying how many of this or this, one of these two values will be displayed inside these uh, these brackets. Um, and that's how we're making it dynamic, where it'll it'll display the proper word. Um, so you can uh, kind of do a lot of things, right? So so you can start to see the flexibility of the of the idea because all of our questions are defined in code. We can use code to define each piece of the question, and you can get really complex with this. I mean, you can your labels can be a bunch of HTML uh, to display something, and uh, in fact, we we kind of have that in our in our docs on question formatting. You can you can add um, uh, markdown. So see how this is italics and this is italics in bold. I just put it here, like I, I put italics and then italics with bold. Um, I can have uh, I can have it in the labels as well, and it would render like this. So you, you know, the formatting goes through, and I can have HTML code. So this is a really complicated one where it's grabbing some values and making this whole button that inserts an image and everything. So it's Markdown and HTML and everything like mixed together. And it renders like this, <laughs> where I've got an image in there and this is bold and this is a value. And 
Um, this is how we do conjoint surveys. So choice-based conjoint surveys um, or discrete choice experiments where we will be randomizing all of these values and even randomizing the images we're showing you and um, we're injecting them yeah, through. I want to add, add something. Yeah. yeah. Go to the author. Yeah. Yeah. So actually we also have some theme set. So it looks much nicer than. Yeah, this is. Uh, right now, like this is not like we haven't applied any themes. So we have a lot of themes and a lot of customized CSS in there. So it looks much nicer. In the yeah. When you when you actually launch it, it looks better. The docs page doesn't have all those libraries loaded on it. So it'll it looks a little less than great. But um, like the whole button should be clickable. But right now, you, should, you can only click on the little, little tiny spot. Right here. <laughs> but, but eventually, yeah. Eventually, the whole when it's when it's live, you can click any of these. Um, and this is also. Ah, uh, we haven't tried that. Uh, right now, it's just CSS. Yeah, I don't think it'll work. I don't think it. I don't think. Uh, well, we can. We can. Oh, it, it runs HTML code. So, yeah. so I wonder if we could do it. Probably, Probably does. Because I've used um, it in and it's useful at times. Yeah. But if you're going to do that, there's probably better ways than inserting it in the question label. So it depends what you're trying to do. Yeah. And we can probably just load it in the doc. So yeah. I'll also emphasize that like we're using Quarto. Um, so you can do anything that you would normally do in Quarto. So you know, Quarto has themes um, that you could rely on here. Um, if you want to change the look of everything, let's let's make it morph, uh, you know, this this theme. Then uh, we just we just change it like this. In the in the YAML, so at up the top, if you're used to Quarto, this is this is something you've probably seen before. So now, when I render my survey, um, it will look like that, um, or it should look like that. Yeah, see, it's uh, it's taken on that morph theme, and so it's a kind of totally different look in color. And I can change it to uh, this is in the survey, right? Um, so the, uh, United, let's make it United, and then again, I don't have to render that; it it all renders for me in the in the app. Um, um there this okay. is united you have the orange buttons Color also changes. yeah and the progress bar changes this is all uh pink fan by the way i mean he's a css whiz and uh this was this was difficult <laughs> very hard to get this all working so we're really i mean it's a totally hacked together version of of, of quarto and shiny and making these two things work together has has been uh, probably one of the bigger challenges um but it's uh these are surveys, right? And these are user-facing things. And so they have to look good. You know, if it doesn't look good, then it's, I don't think, even even Google Forms, as simple as it is, it's a pretty nice UI. It looks nice. Looks good on your phone too. So we've thought through a lot of those things to try to make sure they they are rendering well, that they look good. Um, okay, so I, I demoed the show if, and you, you get the idea of how this works. So you can add a lot of complexity with this simple concept of condition and the thing you want to show on the right. And the show if only works for question IDs, right? So I want to show this question based on this condition. Um, I'll also show skip if, just because it's kind of analogous. If you want to skip, uh, I'm just going through that demos repo, by the way. These are all in here, so you could play with these. If you want to skip to a page, so it has a similar idea, idea where if there's some condition, then skip to this page. So in this case, we're saying uh, this is a question, a survey about, let's say, um, do you own a vehicle or not? And so if you don't own a car, then I don't want you to take my survey. I'm, I'm only interested in car owners. So if you choose no uh, on the vehicle simple skipping, then you go to the screen out page. And so that's the ID here. The identifier is the name on the page. So this is the end page, this is the screen out. So we actually have two end pages. We have a normal ending that if you got through the end without being screened out, you go here and there's a close button that says, okay, you're at the end. If not, we just have yet another page down here that the user will not be able to get to unless they get screened out. If they get screened out, they get skipped past everything to here. And so this is another concept that we've thought about is like, how do you end a survey? Well, you could have like four or five different ending pages. You just can't get to them because there's no next button. So if you just don't put the button, then they can't get there. If I put uh, you know SD next here, then you could get to the screen out page, but I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to put a close button or simply leave that off. And that's the end. Um, so all that button does is say, click on this button, it closes the window. So I'll, I'll demo this. When you run the app, it will um, <clears throat> let you in. If I say yes, I, I keep going. You know, If I uh, say no, it goes to the end. Screen out page. You were screened out. Uh, and then you close the close the page. You can't, can't do anything else. Um, now, we do have a more complex skipping here, I think. Uh, what, did, what did we do here? I forgot. <laughs> 
Um, let's run the app and find out. It's if if this was no and oh, and you have no intention to buy, I'm gonna screen you out. So let's say I do own a car, <clears throat> but I only care about if you own your vehicle and you're also looking to buy one soon, right? So it has to have both of those true. If I say no here, I also get screened out. Oh, I get to the end. Um, so that's not, it must be the other one that I get screened out. <laughs> anyway, um, that's that's all we're doing with skip if conditions. So, you know, relatively simple idea, but the the way it's set up is kind of similar with that tilde sign, you know, condition tilde and then the target that you're going to either a question or a page. The rest of our demos are, are demos of like more complex things. Um, we have things like redirection. So like when you get to the end of a survey, you may not just want to close the button. Like this is the, uh, we had a typical close button that you saw, but this is a redirect button. So you you click here and you go somewhere. So you get to the end of your survey, it says redirect to Google. It just sends you to Google. Like, um, in fact, this is just a static button. It just works um, even without being in the app. Um, but we also have reactive redirect. So I didn't really get into reactivity yet. I got into a little bit of it by showing you, you know, the labels that were changing. And like, if you chose Apple, then the label changes. That's actually reactivity happening. But um, this is a more complex idea. Like, oftentimes when people get to surveys, if they're on from a, let's say, some external survey panel, they will get there with some identifier that's passed through the URL. So it'll have like ID equals some number. And when you get to the end, we want you to be able to grab that ID and then redirect them to some other URL by pasting that you that into the URL. So we, we have to do some uh, some little URL construction that happens. And so this has to happen in the server. So we have demos of like how to do that. And then when you get to the end, you click a button and you get sent on to some other website with your unique identifier passing through. Um, so that that is something that it would often look like this, you know, like you'll get sent to Google, but with some ID. Um, that's, that's a pretty specific thing if you're working with survey panels uh, that you need to do. Um, but let me, let me maybe showcase, um, what should I, what should I, what else should I do? Uh, the reactive plot maybe has reactivity. A reactive is external redirect. Oh yeah, that, that one. I don't want to show it though. It's, it's just kind of complicated. Oh, the map is not fully working. It's not, it's not we are, we are, this is the one we are, we are working on. Yeah. I'm very excited about it. It, it, it looks so cool. Um, it's purely just a dependency problem. Like we don't have the, one of the CSS libraries is like not loading properly. So it's it's a it's a leaflet issue. We're using leaflet to make the map, and uh, uh, I have to I have to make sure leaflet gets supported. So I'll I'll do this one to showcase reactivity. Um, actually, you know what? Let's do randomization. I think this is easier. It's an easier. Uh, yeah. So so react reactivity. Uh, let's just randomize the question labels. Reactivity is the idea that. The, the like the content in the survey that you're seeing is going to be served from the server over here, not here. So anything we put in here is kind of static, okay? So let's say I wanted to show a random number and I, I said, okay, I'm gonna just put a random number right at the start of my script and I'm gonna do uh, are you NIF one and I just get some random number, okay? And so then I start my survey and I run my app and there's my random number, okay, 0.37. So now if I try to run it again, you might think I'm going to get a new random number, um, but it's the same. <laughs> uh, it's the same because Cordo is static. So it just ran this one time, it generated a random number and it stored that content in my folder over here. So that's embedded in this, this page. Like if I look at this page, that number is stuck there. Um, so actually the way this is working under the hood is it, render, it renders the Cordo page into a static page. That page is just a bunch of HTML content. See, even our buttons and everything are here. They don't do anything. They're just HTML. And that number will never change because it's hard-coded into the HTML. And so our Shiny app is literally just going into here and chopping this up. It's just parsing through the HTML and grabbing the pieces it needs to serve to, to the Shiny app. Um, so that's not going to work. If I want to make it actually random so that it changes on every person, then I have to do this in the server because the server is unique to each session. So when a new person starts, they get a new session that's served to them. And down here in the server, if I generate a random number, I can display that random number up here. So now we're, we're working with how Shiny works, right? So this is, this is much more Shiny-like. And in fact, I'm not even going to really do all of this stuff. I'm going to showcase that same example. I think I can, I can do this really quick. Um, 
I should be able to do this, right? Store the value and then use the value. So let's let's say my you know random number is this random number. It's it's one, <laughs> uh, one random number. And there it is. Uh, I'm going to store that value. Uh, I have a function called SD store value, and this will actually store this in my uh, database. So when I run my app, nothing's displayed yet. I'm just creating a number. You can't see it. Um, but when I when I look in my data file here, there's a random number that was generated. See, random number, and it got stored. It's 0.97. If I run another one, I will get a new one because this was generated in the server. So this is unique to each person. So each time the person gets it, you get a new number. Now that's down in my server. Like that's not on the page yet. How do I show it to somebody? Like, where is my random number on the page? So um, to do that, I have to use a little tool. Um, random number is, uh, I can use an R function that we created called uh, SD output. Um, SD output. And I'm going to display that value, that that thing that I created in the server, I can I can show it to somebody up here. I think I have to say type equals value. Yes, we have different types. So you can show whole questions. You can define questions down here. You can define all kinds of things down here. Like this is a question that's being defined in the server. And then we're showcasing it later. So now it's going to run this code to grab the value from the server and showcase it. Uh, in, in and show it to you in the in the app. So uh, it'll generate a number, and uh, oh, your random number is that, and it didn't run <laughs> because I didn't put R here. Sorry, this is just yeah, yeah. it's that. R. That's what I need to, yeah, to yeah. tell. This is R language. Um, let's do it again. Run my app, and we get a number. Okay, yeah. that's my random number. So point four four something. If I do it again this time, I should get a new one. Yeah, point six or something. So that number has to come from your server. So anything that's dynamic, that you want to be unique to a person, has to come from your, your server. And again, something that's kind of hard to do from, I actually like the fact that this is more explicit. Like when you're doing something like this, maybe in Qualtrics, I'm sure they have a random number generator thing that you can display a random number, but it's unclear how it's being generated, where it's being stored and things. So here it's, it's, it's much more clear. Like you're generating it on each session here down in the server, you're displaying it very explicitly by running a function to display it, and it's being stored in your data. So anything that gets stored in our data, we have access to. I could show any of these values. I could show the value of the time uh, to a user. I could show Q1 labels to a user, any of these things. Um, so I'm just displaying the, the random number. So that's reactivity. That's the idea. And we can take it pretty far. So later in this survey, we have um, we have this section that says SD output Q1, and this is a question type. I'm not showing you the, the value, I'm showing you the, the, the question. And down in my server, I have a, a, a question that I've generated. Um, so this one, I have some random labels. I'm, I'm creating a some, some labels here, and it, it kind of looks like this. So option one, option two, option three, and there are three different random numbers. So when you run this thing, you're going to get a multiple choice question that says, display the numbers 56, 88, 82. And those options are dynamic. They're going to be unique to every person. Every time you start this, you're going to get a new set of random numbers chosen from one to 100. And this question that you, you would think I should put this in here, right? I shouldn't I define my questions like this? Uh, but if I do that, it's only gonna display once and it'll be the same for every person. So instead I'm defining the survey, survey question down here. It's called Q1. And I'm using SD output to display that output up here dynamically. Every time I double click, it like pops up my dictionary. So let's let's see this working. Um, so this is 38396, right? And these are random numbers that were chosen for this user. And you can see them here, right? 38396. Yeah. Um, if I run this again, so I stop my server and I run it again, it'll refresh. it'll refresh and I get, you know, three new numbers that were chosen. And those were, you know, stored here as well. Um, <clears throat> So I'm randomizing my question labels by dynamically creating something that's going to change for every person and then injecting that into the question, then displaying the question here. So there's this whole like loop process. And that's that's how Shiny works, by the way. If you're building a Shiny app and you want you know, a plot that shows here, and then when a person clicks on this button, it re-renders the plot and shows you a new plot. That's, that's the logic. So it's kind of like this. If you're familiar with Shiny, the, 
the QMD file is kind of like your UI. Like this is where you're putting outputs. The server is where you're defining uh, the content that you're going to display in that output. And so this, in this case, most of the time we want to either display a value, like some value that we stored, like this thing, or a full question. <clears throat> And this is how we implement conjoint surveys. We have discrete choice experiments. That's something I do a lot in my lab. We will randomize the labels that we're showing people. So every person sees a unique experiment. And, um, but the, the survey itself is, is fixed. It just looks like this. You see a bunch of SD outputs, like SD output one, two, three, four, five, but your set of five questions is gonna be totally different from the next person. Um, okay. So have you used this for one? I've used it for a whole class that I just ran this fall, and uh, which was very risky because <laughs> we were developing this as I was using it. I was always like one week ahead of the class, but we just ran six conjoint surveys uh, with my student team projects and they all ran just fine. Um, so it is, it is working. Um, I'm realizing this is like going on for a while. We have not a lot of time. I want to showcase one more thing, which is the data. Like where do I store the data? How do I store it? And then what can I do with it? So I'm going to showcase this reactive plot one which is a kind of a fun, unique one. So this one <clears throat> requires a database connection because what I'm going to do is the user is going to click on answer. And then when they get to the next page, it's going to show you a bar chart of all of the answers so far. So you get to see your answer in comparison to everyone else. So think of it like if you've ever been to like a, a conference and they have Slido where they have a poll that's live and you see the bars updating, you could do that with this where every user clicks on the first question, and then when they get to the next page, they see the results of everybody. Uh, but to do that, I have to have a database, right? I have to store all those responses that people are clicking on. So let's go to database connections. Um, we have a whole page on this. Any, anything that you're stuck on, you just you know go find it. on the. It's, it's in here somewhere. Storing data, how do we do it? We use Supabase. Um, it's a wonderful project. Um, it's like an open source Postgres uh, database. And you can have two databases. Uh, for free. And then in each one, you can have like unlimited tables. I mean, our tables are very small. So I just have all kinds of you know testing tables that we've created. Um, but let me walk through how we kind of configure things. So first of all, I have a, I have a, a database here. I signed up with my GitHub account. It's, you can sign up with anything. It's, it's free. Um, and my database configuration pieces I need are right here. So you go to project settings, and then you go to uh, database. And I need a host, a database name, a port, and a user, and a password, which I'm not going to show you. Um, so I copy these over. These are perfectly aligned with this because we wanted it to be easy. I have DB names, we have a port, I have a port, and I have a user, and I have a user. Now, the table can be any table name I want, right? So I'm going to say, you know, my table, I'm going to call it my test table because I have I probably already have something called my table. I have so many test data. Um, my test table. So when I generate this, when I run this app, it's going to create a new table and I'll be able to see it over here. It'll pop up. But it's not going to work just yet because it's not authenticated. So I haven't given it my password. Um, and I do have a password for the database that I, that I created here. You know, in my project settings, I can, uh, I, I can create my uh, password and I can edit it. Say database password. I can, I can change it. So whatever I have created, so when I when I first created, I've already done it here before starting this demo, but once you've made your Supabase password, you have to store it somewhere here. And the really not secure bad way to do this is to do this, like whatever my password is. Like you could do this, but then you might accidentally push this to GitHub or something and share your password with everybody. So you, you don't want to do that. So we've created a better way. Um, we have a function, of course, uh, called SD store password. You load the package and you say SD uh, store store password or set password. And whatever I put, let's say my password is foo. I'm going to run that and it creates this little dot R environment file. See this thing? Now I have a special thing called foo password and it's foo. Um, that is inside my folder and it also creates um, a git ignore file uh, that puts that in there. So you don't accidentally push this thing. So it's like really try, we try to be very secure with this. Like, please don't accidentally send your password to other people. So this is local to my machine. It will always stay on my machine and no one else. And now when I, when I run my app, if I run this database function, it will send a connection. It'll use that password and all of that will happen. Now I have to reset it. It'll say, you know, password was set. Um, you have to restart your, your R session because it, it can't read that, uh, that R environment file until you've reset it. So I'm going to restart it. And if you ever aren't sure you like forgot your password, you can say SD show password. 
and it will show it, but it'll make sure you really want to do this. It's like, are you sure you, yes, I, I do want to show the password. Okay, your safe password is foo. Um, now, it won't work because that's not my real password. If I try to run this, it's going to say, hey, error, mer, you know, I can't uh, connect. Like you don't have the right password. So, and so for this demo, I actually saved my R environment that has my correct password in it. And so I can stick it here and now it should go. We might still have an issue though. If I try again to connect, um, yeah, because I didn't have the this, this thing. This is on GW. Um, GW blocks us. So we have to set this to disable, which is a security thing. It doesn't actually really do much, I don't think, but um, we can't get through GW's network if we don't disable this feature, this GSS in mode. Um, do you remember it's what this of, was? It's kind of protection. Some sort of protection yeah. layer yeah. that we probably should not disable, but on GW, we have to. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, we have lots of messages that pop up that'll tell you, you know, did you update your password? If not, you know, maybe you should try setting this to disable. Um, but you can you can check your password connection before you launch your app. Like so, you just run this function to to make sure everything's connected. Still not uh, not there. Maybe I have to quit and restart because I I think my R environment is just not recognizing it. Um, let's try again. Yes. Okay. Successfully connected. So now I'm I'm in. I've got my database connection. So when I run my app, it will now be storing those values. Here, and uh, you can see it in my table. I'll have a, there's my test table, there it is. And stuff's already coming in. I've already got my first session here. So I can click stuff, like I'm, that's my favorite penguin or something, and the next, and it shows a plot that should load. I don't know, it's taking a bit. Uh, the connection's bad here. Um, okay, I only have one connection, which was uh, one observation. So if I hit re refresh, yeah, this is usually really fast. Oh. The cookies are enabled, so it's not allowing me to go. When I hit refresh, it's it's still registering me as the oh, same yeah, person. The, uh, um, this is yet another. We have all these different settings down here at the very bottom. This SD server function, so you can set, you have to set the database. Here we've required that you answer all the questions. We also have a cookies, um, which if you have that on, which is the default, it will uh, when you hit refresh, you it, it won't register a new user. It'll just send you back to the page you were on. So if you have a survey that's live, you typically want that. You, if someone closes the browser and then they reopen it, they want to go back to where they were. They don't want to get kicked back to the beginning. Um, so that's on by default. But for, for this purpose, we want to actually have a new user every time we rerun it. Um, so we'll turn that off. And um, let's click Chinstrap. OK, now it's loading quickly. Um, yeah, so I've got a, I'm getting a summary count of you know, how many people chose what. So every time I refresh, if I click it, uh, I'm just getting a new plot of the data. So it's just pulling, uh, if I hit refresh, you'll see these, you know, these rows are coming in. These are the things that people are clicking on. So this is like maybe a poll uh, that you could be doing and each user is clicking on this at once. And in, uh, now it's still running locally, right? I, I don't have this deployed, but as soon as I deployed this to let's say shinyapps.io, then all of us could go to that URL, click on it, and we would all see each other's results right away. Um, but this is just demoing that you can you can do this, right? Like all I'm doing down in the server is we have a function called SD get data and it has a refresh interval. So every five seconds, it's going to refresh uh, with any new, and you can make this really fast. You know, you can make it 0.1 or whatever. And so it's constantly hitting the database so that it's gonna refresh that really fast, but that's probably unnecessary. Um, and all it's doing is rendering a plot. Um, so it takes the data, the latest data it gets from the database. It, uh, it this is just some simple ggplot code to make that bar chart, and this is called a penguin plot. And so down up in my uh, survey, I have on the second page. So that's the question on the second page. It says SD output. Um, you chose this, so it's 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 saying it's telling me what thing you chose first, and then it's using Chinese plot output to just put the plot in there. Um, and so I can just keep refreshing this thing, and you see how it says you chose that. That's it's just telling me again and again, like what I chose. So I chose uh, Gen2. So you chose Gen2, summary of what everyone else chose. Um, so you can do all kinds of things with this. Once you have access to all of the data in your server, I mean, whatever you wanted to do with this, you could. Let's say you wanted to ask someone their age, and then you say, um, here's the histogram of everyone who's taken, of age of everyone who's taken our survey so far. Here's your age. I don't know. I, I don't know whatever you would want to do, but it's, it's, a, it's an ability to do something pretty dynamic. Uh, where you can compare yourself to others or um, do anything else dynamic. Uh, you could make a plot with responses from the prior question, right? So you could say, 
uh, answer a question on page one and on page two, you know, you chose this answer. So now I'm going to do something with that information. I'm going to make a figure out of it or something. Um, I could ask you to answer these 10 questions and then make a plot showing you your summary of your 10 questions that you just answered because I could just grab the data. Um, so that's the idea of like reactivity and um, this is more of why we built this. Like it took a long time to get here. It took us an hour to get to this part in the talk. But like the first part is like, this is the Google form. What's the point? But now you're starting to see like the power of being able to run code live in your server, in your survey. Um, so there's some... Yes. Exactly. So we're, we are now in the mode of calling LLMs real time in our survey to maybe customize your survey to show text that was generated by an LLM that is specific to you and your answers. Things like that, for example. Uh, any of those things could be done pretty easily. Uh, so we're we're just starting to like our demos are just like barely scratching the surface, but there's a lot of like setup here. You know, to get this to work, it there's a lot of complexity. And this is not something I expect like someone who's just learning R for the first time to just pick up and know what to do. Mm -hmm. You have to think about it for a while, and you really have to kind of know how Shiny works a little bit too. So it's um, there is a learning curve, but there's a high potential for, I think, what you could do with it. And of course, it's free, open source, easy to version control. You know, it's there's a lot of benefits of just being able to make your survey, even if it's just a simple survey, in plain text, mm -hmm. as opposed to relying on some complicated or expensive license that has a GUI interface, you know. Um, I don't, is there anything else we should show or talk about? I don't think so. Oh, just getting the data. You know, once you have your database connection, by the way, this DB object, um, if you want to just you know pull the data and look at it uh, at any point, once you've once you've run this to create it, you can just you can say you know data frame is SD get data, and you can get it statically. I mean, this is I'm I'm getting it reactively every five seconds. It's running in my server, but I can also just get it once. Oh, my pool was closed because I um, I stopped the thing. So reconnect, and then there there it is. So here's my data frame. You know, so if you want to get your data out, there you go. So you have a you have a full. Imagine we have you know an analysis script here. Then we just open that up, and we have our 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 package, our database connection, and our and our and our data frame. And so here, we're, once we're done fielding our survey. We just collect the data right away, and here it is. Um, so we can work with it right away. We never have to leave R or our studio. Like everything, the source code to create your survey, as well as the analysis you want to do with the survey data, is all in the same project. Um, and you can name these whatever you want. I mean, I named this. I named it penguins, you know. But I like this is one of my most frustrating things with using other platforms is they create these like ridiculous names sometimes. And I, I can't, I can't name the actual columns. <laughs> and so they have these like super long, complicated names. And here the data is going to come back very clean and easy. Um, and you have total control over what you want it to be. Um, okay. So that there's a lot, there's, there's even more, like we have quite a lot of features uh, in like this table just summarizes them. We have like completion codes that you can generate. We have the progress bar that's happening at the top. Um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so go play with it if you want. Um, it is an ongoing project. Uh, and we do have quite a lot of, uh, of uh, people using it now. We have 70 stars. Yay, we reached 70 on GitHub. And it's been pretty active. A lot of discussion, a lot of people trying it out um, and asking questions on how. So a lot of these features that we have are generated by others. Um, I mean, yeah, the I mean, most the most recent one was the translation one. It was really cool. Yeah, that was, that was um, amazing. Yeah. Stefan Muniz, I guess is how you say his name. You can see like uh, a lot of contributions from uh, other, other people. Other people. It's, it's yeah. so fun to see like we just came up with this random project during the summer and then other people are like, that's cool. Let's try it. And um, so they're, they're really uh, trying it out here. And um, the translation feature was the idea that uh, there are certain messages throughout your app that like you can't you can't change or you couldn't change before we had that feature. So if we had required questions, for example, when I ran my app, um, I it wouldn't let me go on. It says warning, but that's in English. And uh, if I wanted that to be in, in Spanish or some other language, I would I could have to change that. So I could say language equals you know Espanol. Uh, <laughs> and um, that was not a feature we had until he added that. 
And uh, now the system messages, see, even <laughs> everything's in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. um, very, very cool like that he did that. And uh, he's European, so he has a lot of different language needs. And um, like there was no other way to change that. So it, it, it's actually quite nice. It, it, it creates a little translation YAML file that you can now edit every one of those messages. And so you can actually customize it to anything you want, even if it was English. Uh, not the user. This is this is the this is going to be the system setting for that survey. So the user taking the survey wouldn't be able to set the language. We haven't implemented that. That's a good idea though. Set a PR. We can do it. Um, <laughs> but um, but again, not something that we had ever thought of doing. And then someone just made it, and we you know we worked with them on the PR, and then it just worked. So uh, very fun to see the the ideas that people are coming up with and. and uh oh, you can go we have a we have a page oh yeah, i i unshared my screen so i should share my screen for everybody to see this still we have it on the end of the about page yeah. there's like a uh bogdan also helped out with this project over the summer he's one of our undergrads here in emse mm -hmm. uh but contributors page we have several people who've added some things um so Stefan was the the one who built the language feature and a couple other things and then we've had a few others add some even our own here, <laughs> Dan here, he added, he found like a typo in one of our error messages or something. And I was like, thank you. Like, good, good catch. Uh, but he was playing with it, I think last week or so. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's picked up. Are they planning to do trainings in LA? <laughs> On this? I have no idea. I mean, this is so not something we expected to become like a real product. Like I, when I first started, we fully were like, this will be a fun summer project yeah. to see if we can merge Shiny and Cordo. And then it were like, actually, it's working. Let's keep going. And then it kept working. And we're like, okay, it's actually working really well. Like it's uh, it's kind of like a professional tool now at this point. So, um, so maybe maybe someone else will start. To... Yeah, this is where we were like, we didn't. It, this wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> you know, we weren't supposed to make something that was like really working and good. We were we were trying to make something really, I think, more than anything, just for my lab, like some some way to make a custom survey that would be kind of creative and customized and have this reactivity feature. But um, now, yeah, I don't know what to do long-term. Um, my, maybe my hope would be that uh, Posit sees this as cool enough that they just take it on and then I don't have to deal with it because they are, they are professionals at doing this, right? Like professionals at um, picking up great packages and internalizing them and um, like the whole tidyverse and um, even really shiny and stuff. I mean, some of these great packages, Cordo, you know, originated out of our markdown. So there, there, there are packages and ideas that people had that got brought into them. And I would love for them to look at this and fix it because I know that I we've created, you know, a working product, but there's probably way better ways to do certain things. And they have, you know, decades of experience. So that would be wonderful. Um, if it's going to be me maintaining it, it's going to be uh, something that I'm going to have to manage very carefully because I can't spend all my time on this. But we were at like one half of a year so far, six months in. And after our latest, our next like major change, I'm going to be like, okay, no more features. <laughs> no. <laughs> or someone else can manage it. Like I don't know. Ago, it's like, well, this, this is a stopping point and we got to, we got to, we got to stop here. Yeah, and then yeah, we yeah. now, but it's still working on it. People keep saying, well, what if we could do this? And they were yeah, like, I'll, well, what if it could? And then we do it. And I, mean, um, people are gonna say those things. I know. It's going to grow, grow, grow. Like I want JavaScript to me. Yeah, you it want should it. be, but you can be already. But my my response is usually set us PR, and and so if you want to do it, you know, set a pull pull request. We'll we'll take a look at it, and then they did it. That's what got me. I mean, Stefan, yeah, he yeah. caught my bluff. I was like, <laughs> do it, add the translation feature, and then he was like, okay, I will, and then he did, uh, and it's great. Um, so if someone wants to make a feature and add it, I do think it's navigable. I think the code is not too complicated. If you stare at it long enough, you can figure out what's going yeah. on inside. It's relatively. Straightforward. On resource um, management, it's kind of straightforward. Like anything yeah. can make sense. Yeah. So I, I think others clearly it's been possible. People who have been able to look at it. The other thing that I should mention that made this happen, which I wrote a whole blog post about. Um, maybe I'll share my screen one last time here. Um on my well, not that button. My blog uh post. So that was my 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 post from one year ago was like, let's and then, so and then we actually just made it. And so here we are, like August of this year, I actually introduced the one that now exists, um, where we talked about how did we build it and why did we build it? And then at the end, I have this section that says um, the two things that I think really made this possible was Cordo. Cordo, I mean, it kind of emerged during the pandemic. I mean, 2020, I remember seeing a little bit about it. 
but I was, I've always been a our Markdown user and, and saw that as really promising from going from Markdown to HTML. And then Quarto came along and kind of made that all much more professional. Like it's much more well put together. And so I thought, okay, that's what we're going to build this thing on, that we're going to use Quarto. And then large language models came along and taught us how to use JavaScript and all kinds of things. Right? I mean, I know nothing about JavaScript. I can read a function once it's written. I can look at it and go, okay, I see what's going on. But I could never write it myself. And we just steamrolled in progress. We made so much progress over the summer because every time we couldn't figure something out, we would have a conversation with Claude and, and within two hours we have it solved. Not just you know worked out, but fully integrated into the package. So it was truly awesome to see like how quickly we could add something that I, I probably would not have even tackled this project if we didn't have LLMs yet. Just because the, the basic knowledge you need is way more than just R here. You really need web development knowledge. And I know enough, but I don't know how to make it from scratch. Um, and so there are really well-established ways to do certain things that we were really heavy, heavily leveraging that for. Um, so true web developers will probably look at our code and go, oh God, there's problems here. But um, we hope not. <laughs> we, we have tested it quite a lot. Um, and there's certainly like more testing that needs to be done. But that's that's been a major breakthrough you know, for, for making stuff like this. Question Is there any reason um, you couldn't also work with Python? Trying to in import the log in. Yes. Um, I think so. So, this part, yes, I think you could, right? Um, the, the, if you're making part of the uh, QMD file, you, you know, these, these just become Python uh, and you can write Python code, but these functions are our functions. Um, so that this will not run because Python's going to say, I don't know what SD question is. Um, so you could integrate other pieces into here that are doing other things like making a plot or something, but not, not the fundamental core parts of survey down because these are like the SD question, the XD well, next. The those are, make up the SD, like those yeah. functions would have to be translated into Python. Python. Yeah. Yes. So, so that, not, that won't really work. I'm not going to. Yeah, <laughs> and we thought about this. Uh, this is a you know. Yeah, I thought it, I thought it would be that easy. We I, I played around with it a little bit. It's 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 quite different. They do have Shiny for Python now, right? So Shiny is supported for Python. I think it's still a little bit different though in how it works, and a lot of the things we're pulling on. I still don't think it's as mature as the. I mean, Shiny and R has been around for a decade now, so it's very mature, and I think the build out for Python is a from scratch. You know, basically re rebuild, and so some of the things are a little bit different. And I don't, it's not as mature. So you could probably get this, get this there. Um, but I, I don't know enough. And I, and I know this so much better that it was way faster for me to just work here. Um, the other reason though, was I think about the users of who builds surveys and maybe I'm wrong on this, but I, I, it's a lot of social science. We don't see as much of it maybe in STEM, maybe we do, but I feel like a lot of social scientists know R there's like, if I had to pick where are the bodies of people who know R, it's like the statistics departments, the political scientists, oh, people. Sure no, no, I think I'm saying it's, uh, I think it actually might fit the users more even because more people who might want to use this to build a survey might know R and not Python. So it might not have actually been as useful for, for a lot of people, but that might be totally wrong. Um, you wouldn't have to know much R to work with. Yeah, we've we've tried to yeah. we've tried to yeah we've tried to template it out yeah, like a, in a lot of ways. Cool. It's a learning curve. That's a very yeah. yes for a lot of people. Um, and and not on top of that, it's also just Quarto. Like, there's there's all kinds of weird things in here. Like, what are these fences? <laughs> this is a very Quarto like type of thing. And we have Markdown, and then we have code chunks. And so you need to be comfortable with with R and Quarto. And really shiny too. If you want to do anything that is more complicated, like these reactive things, you need to understand what a server is and like what's going on in there. So, so there's there is uh, some prerequisite knowledge here. Um, we're writing a paper on this too, um, because we're academics and we get credit for papers. Um, and uh, we're trying to write a paper to talk about also just like why, why more about why and the architecture and like why this is needed. Um, so part of it is about reproducibility. Like I could just send you my code and you can run my survey and you can see it like instant. Re I don't think there is another survey platform that you can do that on, or you can fully reproduce my whole survey. 
and actually click through it yourself and check it. And um, but that's a reproducibility is one feature. This you know version controlling and things like that on plain text for GitHub. That's what we're going to be writing about. Um, but there's also we we're making the argument that there's like dual learning. Like so, if you learn you learn how to do something really complicated in Qualtrics, then you can only do that in Qualtrics. Like there's not a lot of extensibility from that. Maybe you learned a little bit of JavaScript or something to stick into your Qualtrics. So maybe you learned some JavaScript, but most of your learning is like, I know how to use that platform. Whereas here you learn like Shiny, Cordo, and R, which are useful tools for a lot of other things. And so you're, if you spend the time to like learn R platform, then you're also learning other generalizable skills or vice versa. Like if you already have those more generalizable skills, you can use this. And so it's, you're not spending your time learning a very specific licensed platform product. You're, you're learning a language. And this is true of any open source project, right? Like you're trying to do this thing using that language, but in the process, you're also learning language and all these other usable tools. So it's like, there's a learning curve, but it's a benefit to you to learn that curve <laughs> instead of just learn this one tool. And then that's, I can't use it anywhere else. Like, I don't know how to make this type of survey any other way. Um, so this, this, like when we're, you know, we write a paper, we're trying to justify our thinking and like, what are the benefits and values of this? And also what are the drawbacks? The biggest drawback is probably learning curve. Like it's not trivial, right? You have to figure it out. So we'll, we'll be I working on that. You could build a big UI on top of it all. You could That's... totally build a, you can even build it in Shiny. I mean, you could build a Shiny based UI that launches locally that you build your whole, construct your whole survey in and it renders into a QMD file. I want to talk to you about that. Someone, I have ideas. Okay. Someone's okay, probably so going to send us a pull request to build a GUI interface, <laughs> a GUI for like making it. I'm like, if you can, if you can build it, we will integrate it. But right now we don't have it. Um, all right. That's way past time. We should stop. <laughs>